Hi everyone, welcome to episode 86 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I just got back from a week in San Francisco and it was an incredible experience. Over the next few weeks I'll be sharing some of the podcast interviews that I did with some of the people that I met over there and first up we have Jason Calacanis. If you've spent any time in the startup ecosystem, Jason Calacanis is a name that's really hard to miss. He's run a successful podcast for the last nine years called This Week in Startups. He is the author of a book called Angel, where he shares some of his exploits as an angel investor, where he was one of the first investors behind companies like Uber, Thumbtack, and Robin Hood, just to name a few. And he's the founder of Founder University and the director of a conference called Launch, which is coming to Sydney in June this year. We covered a range of topics in this interview including Jason's experience as a startup founder, where he exited for $30 million, what he looks for in startups and founders as an angel investor, and for anyone that's thinking of getting into angel investing, how they should think about developing their pipeline for investment. Without further ado, here's my interview with Jason Calacanis. Hi, Jason. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Thanks for having me. So for those two listeners uh, at home who may not be familiar with you or your background, do you want to uh, share a little bit about your story and uh, what got you here today? Yeah. Thanks for having me, and congratulations on getting to two listeners. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, no, you're saying two of the people don't know. Two of the people may not know. Gotcha. So okay. just um, So I uh, am most known today as an angel investor, but I started as a journalist and an entrepreneur building editorial companies like Silicon Alley Reporter and Engadget and Weblogs Inc. and Inside.com. But about eight years ago, I started making angel investments and a couple of them worked out really well. I then wrote a book called Angel and I host a podcast called This Week in Startups for the past decade and a podcast called Angel and we have an incubator called The Launch Incubator and we have a university called Foundry University, and we have an event called Launch Festival, which we host every year. And for the next two years, at least, it will be in Sydney. Fantastic. Um, so obviously, a, a lot of things going on, and there's so much that I want to touch on. Um, as you mentioned, you're probably best known for your podcast series, uh, your book, and uh, your angel investments. But I just wanted to go back, um, and potentially something that the listeners or people who follow you may not know was that um, you uh, you founded a couple of companies to sure. to start off with. Yeah. Um, especially in the in the media space, you want to talk a little bit about what those companies were? Yeah. When I was coming up in the '80s and '90s, the most common way you did a startup pre-internet was starting a magazine, and so I grew up watching people like Spy Magazine and Esquire paper magazine. These were the startups of my youth. And so I started one called Silicon Alley Reporter. And it grew to $12 million a year in revenue and 75 employees. And it was a big uh, operation for a while there. And it covered the internet, this new thing, the internet. And so we covered it and uh, it did very well. I sold it to Dow Jones. Eventually, I didn't make a lot of money. I sold it after the dot-com bust, which was when all the dot-com companies went from being worth you know, billions and hundreds of millions to being worth pennies on the dollar, literally. So the valuation of the companies went from, you know, a billion dollars to $10 million. Not kidding, $20 million. These companies got wiped out. And my uh, publication along with it, because they were the advertisers, readers uh, of the podca- of that magazine. Then I started Weblogs, Inc., which created Autoblog, Joystick, Engadget, and a bunch of other blogs. And we sold that to AOL 18 months or so after we started it. So, um, d- doing my research uh, on on some of this stuff as well, um, there's an article that I that I found that mentioned that you were actually offered twenty million dollars to exit before the the dot com. Yeah, is that, is yeah, that it's a big mistake. I wound up getting two years of salary instead of twenty million. Yeah, and so I owned eighty percent of that company or ninety percent. Yeah. So uh, again, just just curious, I guess um, having your time back, uh, you know, there are there are things that uh, you know market forces that that came into play that you had no control over. But I'm uh, just curious to know if there was anything from that experience that you now sort of look for, especially when you consider your angel investments or, or other things that you're sort of involved in. Yeah, I mean, the one thing you learn over time is that the quick way to get risk rich is to sell too early. So, you know, selling too late is the big sin. Uh, 
So you want to sell on the way up multiple times, hopefully, and you can take chips off the table as you go. Things don't grow, you know, trees don't grow to the moon is uh, an expression that some people use here in Silicon Valley. So you have to understand when you're getting a fair market offer for your um, company. But the truth is things have changed a lot since those days. Now, if a founder wanted to get some liquidity, instead of selling for $20 million and losing control of my company back then, I could have said, you know what, I'll sell 20% of the company for $4 million. I'll put $4 million in my pocket, pay some taxes, own a loft, and uh, I'll keep going. Mm-hmm. And so now you have companies like Airbnb or Uber or Dropbox, and they've been able to sell shares along the way, and their teams have been able to uh, sell in secondary secondary shares on the private market, and that makes people go longer. So we've seen this more and more often where a company, including ones we've invested in, have the ability to sell secondary shares. So most famously, Uber had a secondary share offering that was a private placement with Masayoshi San of SoftBank, and he bought $10 billion worth of shares in the company or so for 15% of the company. I'm not sure exactly what it wound up being. And um, those kind of events are more and more frequent now. So most companies are having programs where employees, when they hit four years, can sell some of their shares. Maybe when they hit their fourth year, they can sell the first year shares. When they hit their fifth year, they can sell the second year shares. So they can get liquidity and not be, you know, have all their eggs in one basket waiting for this magical IPO to come. And companies like Uber or Airbnb, they're taking their time to go public because going public can slow a company down or tip their cards as to, you know, what they're doing and how they're getting it done. Sure. Um, and, and obviously you mentioned um, after uh, after your first company, you launched Weblogs as well. Which, yeah, Weblogs Inc. Successful exit. Um, so w- were there any kind of lessons that you took or, or what, w- what was the different approach that you took with Weblogs that you didn't take with, with your previous company? Um, I had a partner, Brian Alvey. Uh, that was one. I had investors uh, in the second company, uh, Mark Cuban, uh, most famously. And um, I sold it after 18 months for $30 million because I needed the money. I was broke. I was negative. 20, 10 or 20 grand. So mm. when you're negative and somebody makes you a big offer like that, it's it's pretty propelling for your career. And that put me in a position where I could play the long game. You know, when I was in my 30s, I could be a millionaire and not make short-term decisions. Sure. And so that was the start of becoming dangerous. I think people with their own chip stack are dangerous. Mm. And so I like to see my founders be able to liquidate a little bit, have a little bit of a chip stack. And you don't want them to have too much because it can be a distraction having a lot of money, but having a little bit of a chip sack, you might fund your next company for the first year and yeah. not have any interference from investors yeah. while you figure it out and not be under that pressure. So I, I kind of like founders who can get to that point in their career. Sure. Um, Certainly took the pressure off for me. Yeah. Um, ma- makes total sense as well if, if founders aren't concerned about um, you know what happens in a year from now. Uh, they're going to be thinking more longer term as well. Yeah. I, I think founders need to think in decades, you know, and they have need to think in a lifetime. Like, what am I going to accomplish in my life? What am I going to accomplish in the next decade or two? Sure. Because the great companies are built over decades, not years. Um, speaking of which, uh, you started, uh, from, from my understanding, you were one of the first podcasters. In the, I was in, in the, the early startup. group, sure. Yeah. Um, so 2009 is, is when you first... Well, even to... before that, we did something called Calacanis Cast. So we did about okay. a year or so of that, maybe 35, 40 episodes. Sure. Um, i got to pull those episodes out. I don't know if anybody even knows where they are. <laughs> but uh, Calacanis Cast was just me taking out a, a Zoom microphone like you got there and just putting it on a table and recording. Um, and then they were just trying to figure out how attachments and closures worked with the RSS feeds back then. Mm. And iTunes didn't have a podcasting app. The iPhone wasn't out yet. And people were using um, iPods, the old music devices. And you would plug your iPod into your Mac. Your Mac would download the episodes. Then your Mac would sync your MP3 files onto your iPod. Then you could take your iPod out and listen to those when you were on the train. So um, it was quite an arduous process compared to using the iTunes app or Spotify or whatever. So we were very early to that. And we reaped the benefit of doing 800, 900 episodes now that are, um, you know, some of them are classics. You yeah. know, having Instagram, Kevin Sistrom from Instagram on when he had 15 people or 
Travis when he was in one city with Uber or Chris yeah. Saka when nobody knew who he was and he had just started making investments. So we, we kind of broke a lot of people. You know, new podcasts have come out since, like Startup from Gimlet, where mm. it seems like every other guest is somebody who I had as a guest four or five years ago. So they sort of created the NPR version of my podcast. A lot of people copied it, which is great. You know, it's a sign of success if people are copying your format and what you do. But I don't do the podcast um, for the listeners, and I don't do it uh, for anybody else but myself. For me, the podcast was a way for me to have a great conversation with uh, friends of mine or people who I wanted to build relationships with. It was a very selfish act Mm. that then resulted in an audience that emerged and revenue from that audience and all those reasons. But to be candid, I just wanted an excuse to talk to somebody for an hour and interview them and get all their smarts out of their brain and into my brain. Uh, absolutely. I the mean, audience that, was secondary. That, that's a very, uh, very similar reason to me. I So I'm naturally quite introverted. And so this was a way for me to get better at, at communicating with people. And as you said, it's a great way to build build a network. So How's it going so far? Uh, in terms of faking being an extrovert? Getting there. You're getting there? I'm getting there. Just fake it. So I can... I can you can collapse <laughs> after this discussion. <laughs> just be super gregarious, fake it, pretend you're like obnoxious Donald Trump, whatever. Shake your hand, smile and then just collapse into a bed and crawl up in a ball and recover as introverts are that's, that's definitely apt to do. As, as soon as the, the you feel exhausted off. after you do one of these? I feel like you run a marathon? Um, not so much. Oh, so okay. I, I, try and, I try and hack the system as much as possible for me. So I, I would find it very difficult to uh, talk nonstop for 10 minutes, oh. but it's very easy for me to just poke, prod, ask questions um, oh. and ask questions. You know, essentially ask questions of things that I want. I'm to I'm the opposite. To. It's impossible for me to shut up for an hour. So. Which is why, yeah, this is this is a great dynamic. For exactly. A show. There you go. Um, so, in, in terms of podcasting, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, it, it was for very kind of selfish reasons. But what, um, you know, at that time, it would have been so much harder, as you mentioned, to to launch a podcast than it is now as well. I still have so many conversations with people that ask me how to start a podcast and it's you know everything's there and everything's available online but people still find it difficult what made you want to push through that kind of challenge and barrier for you to to get into podcasting at that at that very honestly moment? i think people um make too big a deal out of starting projects and they should take more risk it was funny i was i had a friend kevin pollock i still have a friend kevin pollock and he saw my podcasting studio and i said you should do a talk show because he always wanted to do a talk show. And he said, what do I need? I said, well, I have the microphones. You just need a guest. He goes, well, I can get guests. And I said, okay, Kevin, the studio is available on Sunday afternoons. Just tape your podcast on Sunday. Here's the keys to the door Mm. and the alarm code. And so he started taping Kevin Pollock's chat show at our studio, the same one I did this week in startups. And he's never stopped. I never stopped. And I think people overestimate what it takes. And now you see every comedian does it. Everybody's doing it. And it's not very difficult. But, you know, people... I think set up their own roadblocks in life. So they want to be an author, they want to be a basketball player, they want to be a musician, and they start looking for reasons to not do these things um, when in fact all they need to do is do the behavior and they are that profession. So if this morning I played tennis and last night I played guitar, I'm a guitar player and a tennis player. I may be a terrible one, but... I will soon be okay, and then eventually I'll be passable, and then maybe someday I'll be good, or who knows, someday maybe I'll be a great guitar player, tennis player, and backgammon player. You never know until you start doing it, so my advice to young people is to not limit yourself and to uh, RTFM, read the friggin' manual. You know, when I was in IT, many people would say, my computer doesn't work, and we'd say, well, did you read the manual? (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. And many times they hadn't. And so I'd mm. like, you know, open up the page in the manual. I put a paste it on and I'd circle the word, you know, here's how to underline in Microsoft Word. And I'd show them and I'd say, and here's the manual. And we would just joke, RTFM. I see that today. A lot of young people, even people who are older, they just have this incredible gift of the internet, YouTube, Twitter, Quora, all these different places with knowledge, books. Google, Google News, Reddit, and they're like, I don't know how to do a custom audience on, you know, Twitter or Facebook for my ad group, and how do I do retargeting? And it's like, really? Like, there are a thousand videos on YouTube and 10,000 pages on Quora and blogs about how to do a custom audience on Facebook or Twitter and set that up. 
you've chosen not to do it. You, you know, and I've been challenging myself now and it's super silly and stupid, but you know, my tennis ball machine that shoots balls at me stopped working. And like, I just looked up how you fix it and that my heater on my pool broke. And I was like, okay, I took that apart and I figured out what board I needed. And then at least when I hired the plumber to fix the heater, I knew what board it was. And they were like, yeah, it's going to be like $1,500. And I was like, well, the board says here it costs 300 and it says it's less than an hour of labor. So it should cost more like 500 or less. So like, oh yeah, no, no. Oh, if that's the problem. Then it's only 500 or less. I was like, okay. So I think people have learned helplessness or helplessness or they're lazy or stupid um, or self-sabotaging. All these different reasons come into play. But when I invest in people, I look for the opposite group of people, the resourceful people, because getting to a base level of proficiency in any skill does not take that much time anymore. Getting to the base level of skill as an audio engineer, in other words, understanding 60 or 70% of what the best audio engineer knows might take 100 hours or 50 hours. In other words, in a couple of weeks, if you dedicate yourself, you would know 60 or 70% of what an audio engineer who's been doing it for 10 years knows. In that case, you have no excuse not to do a podcast. You just buy the equipment, you play with it, you test it, you make some mistakes, and you move forward. And you might not ever need the last 30% of what the audio expert knows because they're doing live events and they know how to handle special circumstances or advanced equipment or compression. And that, or you can add those skills over time. But most people are scared of being successful is one of my core beliefs and they throw up roadblocks to being successful in their lives. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I just As opposed to just being like, I, I'm 50% of a graphic designer. I made a decent logo for my startup yeah. by watching YouTube videos, and I read this book about great logo design, so I just came up with something, and it's it's like a 6 out of 10, and it should really be an 8 out of 10, but, you know, I'm going to... I spent 20 hours learning how to do it. Six out of 10 is good enough for now. I'll, I'll have a professional do it when I raise money. Instead, they're just paralyzed. I need to raise money before and then give $25,000 of it to somebody to do a logo. It's like, yeah, Steve Jobs kind of earned the right to spend $50,000 on the next logo, whatever he spent, because he was already a millionaire. Like, mm. you are not. You need to get back to the drawing board. I mean, my the... The story for me for starting the podcast was it took me three weeks from deciding to start to learning what equipment to use. I knew, I literally came in with baseline understanding of nothing and recorded. Oh my god! How did you ever do it? Out. You went to college for this? No. How much did it cost <laughs> you to figure it out? How much did it cost me? Yeah, literally totally. just uh, a weekend on YouTube. Exactly. So, it, so it, there's no excuses. So on, on that, like, is is that? Do you think that that's? Uh, do you think that that's an innate ability that that people have in terms of wanting to learn and, and pushing through that, or is that something that can be taught? So of course it can be taught, but, you know, people also have to have the realization, oh, the skill you need in life is to be able to acquire new skills quickly. Well, most people just don't have the self-awareness to understand that that's where the world's gone. Mm. The idea that there's these, like, pockets of expertise in the world and they hide all the secrets and then you have to hire somebody who's an audio engineer to do your podcast or you'll never get it done is patently false. Because the internet happened and all the audio engineers who were generous said, here's the equipment I use. So now you know what equipment to use. And then you see the debate. Oh, you're using the Shure microphone or, you know, the um, Neumann or using the Shure or whatever cheap ones you have. I don't know which ones these are. I don't know. Procasters? Procasters. They cost 100 bucks each. A little bit. A little bit more than that. 150? Yeah, something like that. Okay, so you got the 150 mic. The one yeah. you're talking into from my studio is 300. That's a Shure mic. And the one I'm talking to is a $3,000 microphone from Neumann. By the way, the only people who will know the difference in the microphone quality are the top 10% of the audience, 15% of the audience. So you can have a range of 20x on the price of equipment mm. that only 10% of the audience can actually appreciate. Yep. Uh, and then you can even make up for some of the failings of the, the not good hardware. But the point is, you could figure it out right, in no time at all mm. with five hundred dollars or less in equipment. I yeah. mean, I mean, I mean, this ridiculous. is ridiculous. This is my upgraded equipment. I used to use an H1 Zoom for the first yeah. year, which is a little tripod that I used to place between myself and the guest. 
trying yeah, to squeeze in as Yeah, that was not possible. smart. Not smart, but... That was not smart. I, but I you think, figured that out pretty quickly when you heard the echoes and the banging. Yeah. When you put your AirPods in and you heard the Yeah, but I, the I mean, the, the whole focus for me was, you know, I, I figured that I could always improve the editing, the sound quality and all of those things. But if anyone was going to listen or engage or share it with anyone yeah. else, it was going to be the content. So that's all I focus on. Almost like true. Everything else that I could... Almo know, almost true. People will sit through almost anything for a great guest except for bad audio. If the audio is painful, if it if it's they as, might if it's possible, not possible, but like if it's If it's okay, it's they'll quality. deal with it. Yeah. yeah. You're right. The content is king. Content is queen. That's the number one thing. But you really got to get the audio right too. Yeah. But it, as you said, it doesn't take that much. Yeah. And that's true of everything in life. Startups, music. I mean, the only things that are super complex, you know. I'm trying to think of things that are super complex that would take you know, some serious expertise to, you know, it tends to be the most refined things in the world. Like if you were going to do really high end design mm -hmm. for, of products, like there are people who do that, who have been doing it for decades and are really good at it, like Eve Bahar or somebody, but that doesn't mean you have to compete with Eve Bahar on the next chair. You can make your own chair that competes on some other mm -hmm. vector, not being the highest yeah. designed chair i mean loop, looping that into into startups in general it's it's essentially you know as you mentioned uh you being able to figure out what is wrong with the plumbing or, or with with the particular device at home and then when you're trying to find someone to fix it you know specifically what it is that you're looking for and the you same can't thing get snowed exactly yeah and from a from a startup perspective it's, it's the same thing you know you're getting a taste of the different kind of roles or things that you need at least allows you to to have an understanding of what it is that you look for um, yeah. when it comes to, to hiring or, or growth. Yeah, if you want to make like a deck for your startup, there are people who charge you $20,000 for your deck. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, how many slides? It's like, it's going to be 12 slides. It's like, okay, so it's $800 a slide or something. It's like, yeah, it'd be about 800 a slide. And it's like, or $1,000 a slide. And you're like, uh... Why am I paying a thousand a slide again? Uh, how much do you charge per hour? And they're like, Well, we charge like you know seventy five dollars an hour for an incredible designer. I'm like, so that designer spending twelve hours per slide because this slide looks like it's a piece of stock photo and a border and you know like maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. But you know you have to really, and I talk about it in my book. Just as founders need to do this equation all the time. If your company is printing money and you need a new sales deck and you can get the best one for twenty thousand dollars and your average customer spends two hundred fifty thousand dollars, it's a no brainer. If you're a startup with fifty thousand dollars in the bank, and you have two customers, and you're going to go spend twenty thousand on a deck, and it's forty percent of the capital you have, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, you should probably learn how to make a basic deck and hack it together and buy a template for fifty bucks and do it for a hundred fifty dollars of your time and call it a day. So you have to know when you should be doing these things and when other people should be doing it. And you're outsourcing it. You know, like I used to be handle all my legal issues myself. Uh, for my startup. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, I was like, okay, there's some legal things that I can have handled by a lawyer, other things I can handle by myself. I see people all the time when they're bootstrapping, they do their own trademark, they do their own incorporation. They, you know, I'm not necessarily advising that, but I understand like saving money is important. So be frugal so you can deploy the capital correctly. And then you have times when you don't need to be super frugal. You can mm -hmm. be a little uh, more freewheeling and say, you know what, I'm going to spend $100,000 on radio ads. I don't know if they're going to work, but you know, the worst case scenario is I lose a hundred thousand. We're doing ten million a year in revenue, so it's one percent of our yearly revenue. It'd be a bummer for it to not work out, but I'm gonna give it a shot. When we raise fifty million, I'm gonna buy a, I'm gonna do a five hundred thousand dollar ad campaign to get more drivers for Uber or Lyft or whatever it is. Like, okay, is that gonna work? It's like, we'll find out. You know, if it works, we'll we'll double the spend. If not, we'll cut it in half. Um. Looking at one of the, the previous interviews that you did a while ago as well, um, one of the things that, that you mentioned was uh, when you angel invest, you really look to back the, the founder of course. Uh, more than anything else. Um, obviously, that, that comes up a lot, and sometimes it can be you know very subjective when it comes to things, but are there specific things that... So what are the specific characteristics that you look for in a yeah, founder? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's like necessarily a, subjective when you're evaluating a person. You can look at a person and figure out, are they good at what they do, so whatever their skill is. So if they're mm -hmm. a designer or a developer or a sales executive, you can look at the work they've done in their career and say, you know what, they worked at Google for eight years and they went from you know, a researcher to a sales associate to the VP of sales, like, okay, now they're making sales tools. Like, this is not subjective, it's objective. They've objectively achieved in 
you know, the sales arena. Now, if it's a first-time founder like Mark Zuckerberg, you might be like, well, this person went to Harvard, so that tells you one thing. Mm. Um, and they started a company that's growing fast. Okay, that's objective. Um, so there are two objective things there, like people who get into Harvard are not stupid, uh, and people who uh, are able to build a product that gets across eight campuses while they're at school and has this level of engagement, that's objective as well. So I'm not picking people based on what they look like or their height or how well they speak. I'm picking it based upon what they've built and what they tell me about what they've built. So if I'm talking to you about the, your product and I say, hey, tell me about the business model and you explain this brilliant business model you came up with and how it scales and your revenue model and how it's different and it competes against the incumbents and how the incumbents, you talk to the, you interviewed people f to work at your company who worked at the incumbents and they spilled the beans and told you how they make money and how low their margins are and how your margins are much better because you don't have this infrastructure cost and you're not buying leads, yada, yada, yada. You can say, oh, wow, this person has really thought this through. So asking short questions and really listening to the answer and how considered they are, if they're hustlers, if they're good at what they do, whatever skill it is, whether they're developers or salespeople, marketers, um, inspiring founders, you're, you're going to find out pretty quickly. So I think people say it's subjective, but that's because they're thinking like somebody's making a decision on the person based on who they are, where they came from. That's not how I make it. I'm looking at what they've built, how they built it, what went into it, what the customers think of it, you know, that kind of stuff. But I can also kind of read into people's souls pretty quickly. Mm. I can tell if what they're doing is authentically what they're supposed to be doing in the world or if they're doing this and they're playing the role of founder, but yeah. this is not where they really belong. Sure. Um, Obviously, a big part of uh, Angel, your book, is about helping people um, become angel investors. Um, yeah, it's inspired a lot of people to do that. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of in terms of people that are that are getting into the angel investment game, what are um, what are questions or what are the things that they should be doing to look into to the soul of a founder? Yeah, the the number one thing is to have a strategy for deploying your capital. Um, we call it bankroll management in the poker world. So let's say you were worth $3 million. You said, I want to put 10% of my net worth to work. I'm aggressively going to go after this. And if I lose 300000 I still have $2.7 million left in assets. Okay, great. What you don't want to do is meet your friends, cousins, sister-in-law whose boyfriend is doing a startup uh, that failed, but his other friend has now got the startup that they're doing together. And if they just had $250,000, they would make it work and you give them $250,000 to build it, they never get it done, they come to you for a bridge, you give them another two hundred fifty. dollars now you've spent almost double what you scheduled in one company that no other investors are involved in, has no track record and no traction. That's a big mistake. And people do that all the time. You know, if you're an NBA player with a ton of money, you're constantly getting pitched by your friends and friends of friends to do their businesses. Well, what are the chances that somebody who's in the NBA in a city that is not Silicon Valley is going to have access to the deals that we have here? It's very low. So what you want to do is go to the city and the community that has the best track record. That would be here, Silicon Valley, or New York, or Seattle, or Boston. You know, and you can go down the list of where the biggest companies have come from, LA, Sweden, China, there's a couple of places where big companies have emerged and where there's a lot of deal flow. If you add up all those other places and compare it to the Bay Area, it's less. If you took the top 10 cities, put them together and looked at that deal flow of early stage, it's going to be less than here. So what I advise is make 10 or 20 5K bets, 3K bets, whatever it is, and learn the game of being an angel investor. Get your heart broken and then don't invest in companies before they have their product completed because you don't need to. There's plenty of companies out there that have finished their product and that are looking for funding. So for you as a novice to come in and say, I'm going to thread the needle and do what Jason even doesn't do. I'm going to look into people's souls and I'm going to give them money with an idea. Well, you're going to be severely disappointed because probably 95% of the people that have an idea never actually, no, not 95 95% of people who have an idea never, 99% of people with ideas never execute on them. And then the people who do decide to execute on them and raise money is a smaller fraction of that. And then those ones who actually are able to get a product to market and get customers is an even smaller fraction of that. Why not start and have your starting line be the finish line for those people? 
So when people email me, they have ideas and they want to get coffee with me. I'm like, I don't have time for coffee for people with ideas because everybody on the planet has ideas all day long. And then half the people who are asleep are having ideas. They're called dreams. None of that makes you unique or special in the world. Whatever idea you have that you think is unique and special, it is not. I can assure you that hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions have had that idea. All that matters is your execution. Now, ideas matter, sure, but execution is far more important, far more important. So if you are a new angel, make small bets and people have products in market, in a market where there have been successful entrepreneurs before. And you don't need to be the first person into a startup. You could be the fifth or sixth person to invest, and you can look for signals of quality from other investors. And so there are syndicates out there. Uh, JasonSyndicate.com is where mine is. We have 2,400 members or so. And when I have a deal, I email them. 99 of them can come along for the adventure. It's put in one, two, three thousand, twenty, thirty, forty thousand, 30, 40,000, depending on what they want to do. Um, and I always encourage them to start small and then go bigger as they learn and feel like they want to take on more risks. That's the same advice I give to my parents and my brother, which is go small in the beginning. Just like if you were going to go play poker, you wouldn't go sit at the $100,000 buy-in table when you're learning because you will get demolished because the best players are at that table. You would sign up for the $50 or $20 tournament, get bounced out in 20 minutes, Give them another $20 to rebuy, do that three times, and play for two hours, and it would cost you $60, as opposed to going to that big table and costing you $600,000 to play for two hours, and you lose $600,000. That would be stupid. So people do stupid things when they start angel investing. They think that because they can see this startup working, or they can imagine, or they enjoy the product, or they enjoy the talking to the founder. I mean, people are founders because they're charismatic and they're convincing, so you have to be very careful. Mm. You can meet somebody who's incredibly charismatic and convincing and they just take your $250,000 and pay down their debt and pay themselves a salary and go to a bunch of conferences and never release their product. It's happened to me. Not for those dollar amounts, but I've had people do that, raise money and never get anything done. Um, on that, you've you've uh, invested in over 100 companies? 150 right now. Yeah. 150. Um, Adding 30, 40 a year. What are what are the commonalities between the companies that turned into, say, Thumbtack, um, Robinhood, Uber, uh, versus the companies that, that didn't? Yeah, I'd say very passionate founders who cared deeply about the products and markets they were operating in. If you look at Travis and Uber, he really loved building that product. He loved solving for transportation and making more transportation options available. Marco loves marketplaces, loves home improvement and home services. He actually really enjoys that. Rick Fulop at Desktop Metal, another unicorn we were lucky to invest in. He's really into science and 3D printing and fabrication. Robin Hood and Wealthfront, you know, the founders of those companies are super passionate about giving people the ability to invest and get educated and get a return on their investment. Data Stacks, they were just awesome geeks who love databases and providing that kind of service. So, you know, you, when you find somebody who's super passionate and they're an effective executive, like they're smart, they're resourceful, um, that's really the trend. But, I, you know, I've had people who are just as smart as those people and who are just as passionate about their vertical, and it doesn't work out. There is a certain amount of randomness. You have competitors who can come in and kick your butt. You have timing. You could build YouTube before bandwidth and storage is cheap. You know, there are people who built Uber-like services back in the day working on SMS before people had smartphones that had GPS. Mm -hmm. So timing is a major factor as well. Why are you doing this idea now? What's changed since the last person tried it? Oh, is artificial intelligence really going to make this idea work this time? Is VR going to make this idea work this time? I'm not sure. But, you know, part of it is um, taking risk. And if there weren't huge risks, there wouldn't be huge rewards. So if you choose to play in this segment of the startup community, of the of commerce in general, there's just not going to be a lot to go on. And you have to be willing to make investments with a small amount of your net worth in this space rather than going after, you know, buying Netflix with 100 million plus paid subscribers. Like, it doesn't take a lot of courage to buy Netflix at 100 million paid subscribers or Amazon with, you know, whatever tens of billions of dollars in revenue they have, you know, that's an easier bet. And mm -hmm. therefore, the returns are less. You might double your money every three or four years, not go 3,000x on your money. 
Um, again, I think one of the things that you mentioned in a previous interview was that you know there are probably about 20 or 30 really great companies that are produced every year. Easily here, yeah. 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 Um, you know, obviously there are... Uh, there's a lot more capital and not more people looking for those opportunities yeah. than, than, than exist out there. Um, so from an from a angel investor perspective or just investment in general, how do you, um, how do you make sure that, the, that you find the right opportunities or the right opportunities come to you? Well, I have a funnel from the podcast and our events, Founder University, my social media. So generally people watch our content they read my book, they watch the podcast, go, hmm, he's connected for sure. He's opinionated, but his opinions tend to be pretty smart or at least entertaining. And he's got a great track record and he's super helpful. And the people I talk to who he's invested in before say he's the best investor they ever had. So reputation matters a lot. You know, if you come to Silicon Valley and you ask, hey, what's it like to have Bill Gurley or Ruloff or Botha or Chamath Palihapitiya or Aileen Lee involved in your company, you're going to get these people saying, oh, yeah, these are incredible people to have involved in your company. And those people um, have reputations that then drive entrepreneurs to them. So we've crossed, you know, um, to a moment in time where we're getting inundated with interesting companies and... Um, we're actually on the road looking for companies. So the reason we're going to Sydney um, is not just that we love the city. I love the city. It's a great city. But we are looking for entrepreneurs from around the world to bring them here and plug them into the capital and the talent pool and the customers here and get them on a really fast trajectory that maybe they wouldn't have in their home city. Um, it might be a slower trajectory, and those cities may have... Um, emerging ecosystems right so we had a joke here that like no real businesses came out of florida the state here in the u.s it's like tends to be not very compelling companies and now we're starting to see some com compelling companies come out of florida um, that are real companies not scams mm. and so we have three of them in our incubator right now one from orlando two for miami all because i went to miami for a speaking gig or two got known down there couple of interesting people. So this happens. We go to Canada, we go to New York, we go to LA, we meet the companies, we bring one or two back. I went to Iowa recently. I found two interesting companies there that we may bring into our incubator. So the incubator really helps us. And having all this content, people go, oh, you know, I read your book. You seem like a good investor. Maybe you could put 25K or 250K into our company, or maybe we'll come to your incubator. So you want to have a great reputation for being helpful. Sure. If you're not helpful, not good. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to come back to, to launch in, in Sydney. Um, but I guess for, just flipping that, um, flipping what we just spoke about from a, from a startup perspective as well. Um, you know, it's a hugely competitive market out there. Mm. Um, what's your take on startups uh, creating that brand for themselves um, to make sure that they become the, the go-to place or in the consideration for, for inside a competitive market? Well, Having a product that delights customers and having customers who will not shut up about your product is awfully helpful. So mm -hmm. Slack, uh, Uber, Teslas, they all had a virality to them, Snapchat, where the customers would annoy their friends with how often they brought it up. So if you own a Tesla, you tell all your friends they have to drive Teslas. If you're on Snapchat, you tell all your friends and you show them how to use Snapchat. If you're taking Ubers and your friend doesn't take Ubers, you give them the referral code so you each get a free ride. Like the great products, people can't wait to tell their friends about them. So it all starts and ends with having a great product. On the margins, I think having a great brand and doing branding for yourself as the founder is wise you know doing strategic pr announcing things in strategic publications so you might not need a story in mashable or recode or techcrunch or a tech publication and you might get those by default for raising money what you may really need is you may really need to be in a a trade publication for lawyers because you're making software that would appeal to them or uh, you will need to be on the local news because you're selling ring into communities where there's robberies and getting on the local news in high crime areas make the ring doorbells go out the door really fast. So I think you have to understand that, uh, you know, what vertical you're in and where you can get increased uh, attention for what you're doing. And the thing about marketing is if you have a product that makes money and is profitable and is great, 
you can then spend money marketing it. So an example of that would be we have these great events. We're at break even on all the events. We don't try to make too much money on them. So we can actually spend money marketing. This is what we did for Launch Festival Sydney. We just spent a little bit of marketing doing ads on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, um, just getting the word out about the event. And we spent money to get people to apply for free tickets. And we gave out 1,500 free tickets. Like that's an example of like, that's completely unnecessary, but we just wanted to spread the word and all these tools are out there and we make money a different way. We make money from investing in companies. So if you understand how your product makes money and you've got, then you'll have the ability to spend money on marketing, which can be very powerful. And it, you can afford to lose money marketing, which is incredibly powerful. You know, you see these brands that buy bus ads and outdoor advertising, you're like, oh my God, I, does that work? And it's like, the answer is, it, who knows? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't need to work. They have enough mm. money, enough profitability that they can spend 5 or 10% of their profits on or 20% of their profits on advertising and just grow the company and get that positive flywheel going. So I always encourage people to really work on having a product that delights customers so much they won't shut up about it and then build everything else around that. Yeah. And all the playbooks are out there. And a lot of these marketing tools and tips, I could give you 20 of them. Half of them wouldn't work in six months. The other half might work half as well. They, all of these marketing tips tend to have a half-life. Mm. Infographics used to be like, oh, create an infographic. Remember that era? And then yep. everybody started creating infographics and emailing them to you. And you're like, I get what you're doing. You're sending me an infographic that is self-serving, has your logo on it, and you're hoping that I link back to your site to send SEO juice, and that I'll run your infographic because it looks good in my site. Mm. So yeah, I don't want your infographic. And then people started producing bad infographics. And now infographics are like the opposite of what journalists want to see. They're like, oh, infographics, marketing, bullshit. I don't want this. Thank you. No. Um, so you have to understand that marketing channels burn out. Some of them are timeless. Some of them are uh, have a half-life. So the give to get $10, if people are passionate about the product, that'll probably work forever. Mm. because people feel good about giving their friends $10 off and the acquisition cost might be $30 on Facebook. So giving your friend $10 and you getting $10 in an Uber ride, that actually might be good for Uber. They might be saving $10 every, they acquire, every time they acquire a customer because mm. they would have to do it otherwise through radio or other more expensive channels. Yeah. Uh, w one of the conversations that we had recently on the podcast was uh, along similar lines of the importance of having the best product. And I think the point that was raised was... Uh, having the best product give, buys you more time to, to make mistakes. So whether that's, uh, you know, trying to help you figure out, giving you enough timeline to figure out your marketing or, ha you know, hiring the right team and, and all of those things, having th a product that people really engage with will, you know, just buys you more, more wiggle room. Everything will get easier. Yeah. A lot of times people are very good at the other things and not good at making a great product. So they're good at getting press. Mm. They're good at getting attention. They're good at raising money. They're good at hiring people. They're good at building a culture, but the product is not good. Mm. And so then you spend all this time raising money, building a culture, and marketing it and getting a ton of press, and then the product just fails. Mm. It's like, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> you know, like, kind of sucks, right? Yeah. So you look at, like, fab.com was this incredible unicorn here. A bunch of my friends invested. I passed on investing in it. I was, I like the founder, but it, they wound up, they were selling, like, furniture and, products online that were hip and cool and it got really big and they were incredible at raising money they were incredible at design they were incredible at all of the stuff but the product wasn't essential for people i don't think and so they never really had a great business model with great margins so all of that effort i think then just collapsed because yeah. the product wasn't one of those products that drove people to go to it and seek it out you know yeah you want a product that people will seek out how do i get it yeah is, is that something that you, you look for and test for when you're investing in startups? Because obviously, as, as you mentioned, you know, traction is, is a big part of that. But how do you, how do you track um, or, or I guess figure out whether customers are, are really engaged? Well, I mean, product? NPS score is, you know, net promoter score is that simple question we all get asked over and over again by companies. Would you, how likely are you to refer this product to a friend? Yeah. One to 10. If you're a nine or 10, you're an advocate. If you're under six and under, you're a detractor. And if you're seven and eight, you're kind of indifferent. And so you just, there's a formula you do where mm. you get one point for a nine or a 10, zero points for a seven or eight, and minus one for under six. And the highest NPS score products are the ones that tend to be like these kind of products that people won't shut up about and they tell their friends about. Now, if you're only at a seven or eight, you can still have a good business, but you probably don't have that virality. 
So you better have margins or a monopoly or something, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways to test for it. For me, you know, at the early stage I'm investing, I don't need to have everything figured out. If everything was figured out, then it would be Netflix mm. and there would be no investment opportunity. So if the person's like, yeah, no, it's, we're hoping that we have enough content that people will pay. And right now we don't have enough content and it's kind of a, most people give us a six or a seven or an eight, but there's one or two people give us a nine or 10 and we're studying them to figure out why they love it so much. And it turns out they love documentaries. So we're going to do more documentary style stuff. And those actually mm. turn out to be cheaper to license. So we think we're going to use documentaries are, as our beachhead yeah. to compete against Netflix. We're going to create a documentary version of Netflix. They'll be like, okay, that sounds reasonable. You, you learn something. Sure. You know? So, so I guess just translating that from a, from a founder's perspective, it's you may not have all of the answers, but it's an understanding of what isn't, isn't working and what some hypothetical, not hypothetical, but what some educated Theoretical? guesses are. Theoretical yeah. guesses are. On I think that's probably good. Yeah, lean startup style. Like I have a thesis here and I'm going to test it. Yeah, the founders who measure data you know, they measure what matters, and if you measure it, you can manage it, kind of, mm. are the two phrases that you hear in Silicon Valley over and over again. You know, if you're measuring stuff that's important and you understand your business, you have a greater chance of being able to grow it. Startups are about high-growth businesses. If you're not high-growth, there's no reason for you to exist. You're not a Silicon Valley startup. You're just a mom-and-pop business or a small, medium-sized business, and that's fine. Mm. But, like, pizzerias... There's no theory of like my dry cleaner is going to grow, you know, to 100 million in revenue with a 60 percent margin in the next seven years. It's unhealthy growth for a dry cleaner or a pizzeria. Mm. So we have we're looking for businesses in Silicon Valley that have unhealthy growth, like unreasonable growth. In fact, that's what VCs are looking for. They're not looking for the normal growth that a business like organic growth would have. They're looking for exceptional, insane growth. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so, funny ones to loop back to to launch, which is coming to Sydney. Yes, we're coming to Sydney in a couple of fifty days. Yeah. We'll um, there. Yeah. Do you want to share a little bit again for for listeners who may not be as familiar with launch? Yeah. So, launch festival is our biggest event. We've been doing it here in the valley, uh, in San Francisco, rather in the city, for f- twelve to fifteen thousand people, depending on the venue we can get. But we are pretty well known here in San Francisco, and we don't need any more promotion here. And so I've been thinking about doing it internationally. Uh, Melbourne, Sydney, and a couple of other cities were very interested in hosting us. We had two amazing offers from Melbourne and Sydney, and we had to make a very difficult decision there as to which city to pick. Um, And it turned out Melbourne actually gave us a slightly better offer, but Melbourne had stolen all the conferences already. And so Sydney and some of my friends in Sydney were like, please don't go to Melbourne. We have no conferences left in, in Sydney. Uh, Melbourne sponsored all the conferences there. So um, the the New South Wales government, Destination New South Wales, NSW, the Department of Industry and the Business Events Sydney Group put together a package for us that made it kind of plug and play for us to do the type of event we want, which is we don't like charging founders. We don't like making money from events. We just want to serve our mission, and our mission is to support founders and inspire innovation. So we've got a nice venue. It's got five, 600 seats. We've got 1,500 people RSVP'd for free tickets, and we'll sell you know, a low couple of hundred paid tickets. We'll have a couple of dinners, and the content will change the lives of the founders who go. They will be inspired, educated, networked. They'll have some epiphany that helps them 10x, 5x, 2x their company, maybe even come up with a 100x better idea that they have now. And so all the content will be focused around that founders and all the founders coming are coming as our guest for free and really the guest of, um, you know, the New South Wales government and the whole team that put it together. So we'll do it for the next two years. Um, If it works out and everybody's happy with it, we'll continue. And for us, we're trying to get people from that region of the world to think about opening an office here in San Francisco. I think the idea of keeping your office in Australia or Sydney, Melbourne, wherever you are, New Zealand is fine, but you do want to have an office here to tap into the money because there's not unlimited venture capital in other parts of the world or angel and seed investing. And in San Francisco, there's literally in the Bay Area unlimited capital for to be raised. Mm. There's an unlimited number of angel investors. Every time a company goes public here, whether it's Dropbox or Uber or Airbnb or Facebook and Twitter, 
you create all these millionaires who then go out and invest in companies, their friends' companies, and some take it up as professional investors, or they go on and they start their own venture firm. Evan Williams did Twitter, and then he started Obvious Ventures, his own venture firm on the side while he was running Medium. So you have you know this sort of constant renewal of the angel investor class here, the seed investing and the venture capitalists. So I'm really looking for companies that are in our Goldilocks zone. It means they have some customers. Maybe they've raised a million or two or less, but they don't have a Series A yet. When they're in that zone, they've built a product and they don't have a Series A yet, we can really help them. So we want to find 10 great companies and bring them to our incubator. So we're going to give a prize at the event, the best startup presenting there across the five different competitions we're having, four different competitions we're having for startups. One's an idea competition, the fifth. We're going to give a $100,000 investment and invite to the launch incubator too. So hopefully whoever wins will accept that and come to the incubator. Um, and then we're going to do a $25,000 prize for our 20 free startup ideas. So if somebody presents a great idea and they want to pursue it and they have got a good team, we will invest $25,000 in their company and see if they want to come to the incubator after they get it, the prototype built. So we're going to take some chances ourselves. We're going to invest a little bit of money in these companies and see what happens. And then Republic which is an equity crowdfunding platform, is doing their own competition where we'll have five or six companies that are raising money on stage doing live equity crowdfunding on stage where anybody can invest. Or I shouldn't say anybody, but I think most people will be able to invest. I think it depends on regions since this is an international event. But I think mm-hmm. it will be largely local people uh, coming to the event, some people from international. And we really want to get to know the founders there. And we want to inspire them. And we want to start a relationship and a discussion with them about Hey, do you have a great idea? Hey, can we invest in it? Do you want to come to our incubator? And every time I go to a different city, I find two or three great companies. I think that's like a big hack for me. Mm. You know, uh, fa- great founders in you know cities that are not San Francisco Bay Area. They are underappreciated typically. They have they're underfunded typically, and so we want to try to make them overfunded. Well, not overfunded, but appropriately funded, generously funded. <laughs> Any particular industries or verticals that you're focusing on? I am not an industry-focused investor. I'm a founder-focused investor. I think if you try to focus on an industry, you will miss the next big one because nobody can define the next big one, on-demand, mobile. People didn't exactly know what to call them. They didn't Mm. know that com.com and other apps on your phone would become companies that made millions, tens of millions of dollars. They just couldn't even appreciate an app economy. So it's not like when the iPhone came out, people were like, I'm going to start an app-centric you know, venture fund or I'm going to create an on-demand venture fund when Uber and Airbnb started doing on-demand housing, on-demand mm-hmm. cars. So I don't focus on verticals. That being said, we'll have three, three of the competitions will be the 1.0. Uh, I'm sorry, year one. Year one means the company's been in the market for under a year, 12 months or less of... Uh, the product being launched. Then we'll have a cryptocurrency uh, blockchain competition, and then we'll have a frontier technology competition in addition to the 20 great startup ideas, which aren't built yet, and the Republic equity crowdfunding session showcase. The um, frontier tech is tech that is not yet mainstream but is being built now. So flying cars, robotics, Cafe X, blockable building, housing with robots, uh, automating them. So things that are kind of far out there, but not that far. In other words, if you went to a dinner party, you know, it might be one person who has an Oculus or maybe one person every 10 dinner parties has an AR glasses like HoloLens. That would be frontier technology. It's on the frontier. There are people on the frontier, just not that many of them yet. Frontier technology would have been mobile in 2000 to 2005. That would have been frontier technology. It's no longer frontier technology. Now everybody's got a phone, therefore it's commonplace. Sure. Um, just on, on launch, what uh, where could, if people are interested in finding out more, where can they get more details and, and what are the dates? So launchfestivalsydney.com. Mm-hmm. If you just type Launch Festival Sydney into Google or Bing or GoGo, uh, DuckDuckGoGo. Um, or you can just go to launchfestivalsydney.com. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter at launch. We'll be talking about it there. I'm at Chasen on Twitter. You can follow me too. Uh, and uh, yeah. Make sure those links are in the show notes. Um, final question for me. 
as well. Uh, so you, I, I'm assuming from your earlier response that you've been to Australia before. I've been to Sydney. You yeah. spent a bit of time. Yeah. Um, what's I climbed your, the Bay Bridge. Uh, what's your? That's a tourist thing to do. Yeah. And yeah, I went to the zoo. Is. What's the zoo across the Taronga Zoo? Is that the one across the bay? You take yeah. the ferry? Yeah, I went there. That was very impressive. Yeah. I want to do a private tour of that, though, this time. You should. It's a good yeah. spot. I um, want to feed some of the dangerous animals. And then uh, we're going to go scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef. Very cool. It's very selfish. I basically was like, hmm, Great Barrier Reef could be going away. Uh, although I heard it's coming back a bit. Um, but uh, I'm going to scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef on Friday, Saturday, Sunday after the event. Yeah. It'll start getting cold in June. Yeah, but it's the best diving. So it's going to be 60-degree water, but the water will be the clearest. And it's also the whale migration season. Mm. So I hope to dive with the whales. Very cool. I think that would be very cool. Absolutely. I've never... Have you gone diving on the Great Barrier Reef for snorkeling? No. But yet. you're from Australia. I'm from Australia, and, and I haven't you, done that. You have the greatest resource in the world in your backyard. I know. And you basically have ignored it your whole life. It's true. Really? It's true. You are a disgrace <laughs> to Australia. How dare I you? Am. I'm joking. I am. No, I mean, if you ask somebody from New York if they've ever been to the Empire State Building or Statue of Liberty, the answer is probably no. Yeah. And then everybody's like, you've never been to the Statue of Liberty or New York? Or it's like, well, why would I go there? It's all tourists. Yeah. It's annoying. Yeah. Like, I've never been to Ellis Island. They, it was closed when I was a kid. Then they reopened it, you know, in the 90s or something. But I have been to... I have been to the Statue of Liberty when I was a kid, but I have to take my daughter to the Statue of Liberty. Mm. That'd be a good thing. It's, it's interesting. I was uh, talking to a friend of mine who moved here uh, about 18 months ago, and he said he spent the first three months doing the super touristy stuff, and since then he hasn't done anything at all. And you Walked over the Golden you. Bridge? Golden Gate? He walked over the Golden Gate Bridge? Yeah, yeah, like he literally just ticked everything off. Perfect. In San Francisco. So. All right. Well, then when I get there, you got to come scuba diving with us. Yeah. There's some sharks. It's, it's done. Don't we'll be scared. <laughs> Rohit, we'll, don't be we'll scared. Take, we'll take a video. You know anybody who's been attacked by a shark? Do I personally know anyone? Yeah. No. Do you know anybody who knows somebody? Have you ever been at a dinner party and said, yeah, my friend got bit by a, a bull shark over at yeah. Not by a shark. They Bay. haven't been bitten, but I think there was a, they were at the same beach or something, so the beach got closed. Oh, they were at the beach when the beach yeah. got closed. Yeah, I mean, my, my girlfriend was in East Timor, and there was an alligator on the uh, on the beach. that they drove Like a sea crocodile. A yeah. Sea crocodiles are it dangerous. Was huge, yeah. They're giant. They're yeah. like 20 feet long or something crazy. Like they just float in the ocean and just bite people. Yeah, and apparently this one was just lazing on the beach. So I wonder if so sea crocodiles actually go after humans or not. I don't know. Being Seems like you guys now. got a lot of things down there that can kill you. We do. Yeah. We do. It, it, it'll be a great trip for you. How, how long are you in Australia for? I'll probably go for like two weeks. Yeah, 10 days, yeah. two weeks, something like that. It's a big trip, so got to enjoy it. Makes sense. Uh, we need to get one of the airlines to support us next time. We weren't able to get one of the airlines to give us a bunch of first class tickets to send a bunch of people from the US over. Yeah. That was the one thing we didn't get done this year. Qantas, this is a call out. I don't want to call anybody out by name, <laughs> but I would think that getting all these great entrepreneurs and investors to come over, it would have been a lot easier if one of them gave us a bunch of first class tickets to show off yeah. how great their first class. So I think a lot of them also had space on their flight, so I was kind of bummed. Mm. Couldn't get it done. But we have uh, the support of the New South Wales government, so I just wanted to say thank you to them and Destination New South Wales, Department of Industry, and the Business of Sydney. Thanks again. Fantastic. We could not have done it without them. Sorry for plugging during your show, but no, no. I feel um, like I got to give my my props to the New South Wales government because they r literally made it impossible for us not to come down there. They were like, let's do it. We want you. We want to have everybody here. So it's going to be a process. I think the first year... We got a lot of people interested, and some people said yes to speak, or some people said next year. So I think we're going to have to build it up over the years and prove to people that there's a reason to go down there, you know, and check out these companies. Yeah. And I know they're worth it. I mean, you have Atlassian and a bunch of other companies, Hot Dog Software back in the day. Like, mm. you've had a lot of big companies down there. So I think us going down there will help validate, like, hey, you know, there's there's some opportunity here. For sure. I mean, I mean my, my final question for you was going to be, what's your what's your read of the ecosystem in Australia? Well, I'm good friends with Mark Pesci down there, and he alerts he's doing me. Twister? What's that? He was doing the this week. He's doing this week in Startups Australia. Yeah, yeah, he's going to do another season. I think um, we basically keep doing a season after season, um, and so we need a uh, sponsor for that. We'll get one. Um, and my read on it is promising. Not a lot of capital mm. invested, so not a lot of venture firms, but growing. 
not a lot of angel investors, but growing. Um, and plenty of support from the government, which is good, but that can only take you so far. So that can help get you started, but you can't rely on it. But English speaking, very smart people, and a great place to live. I think being a great place to live is going to become a more and more valuable asset. Like everybody I know who's moved to Australia has loved living in Australia. Like if you look at the top 20 cities to live in, mm. I believe three of the top 20, and it might be three of the top 10, according to like US News and World Report or whatever that does this puts us together, were in Australia. Yeah. I think Melbourne's been voted the world's most livable city seven years in a row or something. Something crazy. It's like, And then yeah. Sydney is like number three or something. And like, Maybe Denmark or Oslo. I don't know what's in between. Actually, I think those are no longer in it because they're too expensive. But the combination of low crime, great opportunity, clean city, reasonable taxes, beautiful weather, great education, great people, great arts, all of that combines to make it a great place. It just mm. happens to be 14 hours away. It's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, we, we might... If this goes well, we might be we might do an incubator class down there at some point, or we might do a founder university like in between. So we we really want to invest in having our brand in other cities and inspiring founders to start companies because that's really what it takes. Is you have to inspire people to say it's possible to start a company, right? So when they see Atlassian, that should give people like, oh, you can build a billion dollar company here, mm. right? The founder of Atlassian bought the most expensive house in Sydney. I read, like, this is like a a good sign that people are like, hey, wow, look, Atlassian's made all these millionaires and all these billionaires and all these people fabulously wealthy and built great products and bought companies. Th this is what the world, this is what your region needs more of, is people mm. building large companies and being bold. And hopefully that inspires people, right? Yeah. So it only takes a couple of companies to inspire an entire ecosystem, yeah. and you have a couple. Yeah. And I mean, to, to your point as well, um, it's the whole making the millionaires who then feed back into the ecosystem, becoming angel investors or starting the next company yeah. and things like that. It just kind of liquidates the, the, the market a little bit more. Yeah, you get a little bit of um, monetary uh, velocity. The money whips around a bit and that's mm. good because then those investors might even make more money. So they invested 10% of the net worth and they doubled their net worth. Now they're like, oh, I'm emboldened. Now I invest 20% of my doubled net worth, which is really 40% of my previous net worth. And they get going on it, right? They get more emboldened. And that's what you need. It's just people to start getting emboldened, to start companies, to invest in them, to support them. And you'll get there. You know, I see it happening in a lot of different cities around the world. A great entrepreneur can come from anywhere. Mm. It just happens to be here has the m largest density of money. So the largest number of founders come here. So it's sort of like Hollywood, like our do great actors and directors and screenplay writers come from other cities? Of course. But a lot of them wind up in L.A. for a reason. It's, there's just a critical mass. Mm. And so you can build critical mass in your city. You just have to be patient and feed the ecosystem. Absolutely. Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show. Rohit, it's my pleasure. Uh, for anyone that wants to say hello, find out more, get in touch, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Jason at Calacanis is my email. If they have a great idea and they want to meet for coffee, no. If they have a startup and they have a deck and they have a product and a link and traction, I will review it over email and then maybe invite you to come have coffee with us or come to our incubator and sit in or and audit it or come to founder.university and spend three days with us in our founder university class or something like that. So we're generally... You know, it's you can certainly email me your ideas. It just doesn't really mean much. Um, mm. But I like to meet people when they've kind of built, you know, two team members, one, two, three team members. They got a little MVP, a product ready to go, deck. Maybe they got a couple of customers. We call it our Goldilocks zone. Yeah. Post ideas, pre Series A. Perfect. Once again, Jason, thanks for coming on. It's been thanks an absolute for pleasure. Me. Thanks for watching this episode of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, you can find the full show notes for this episode at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode of the show. In the meantime, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.